So today we're going to talk about vocabulary, um, and I have a recommended reading for you guys if you're just if you're really interested in liter literacy for deaf and hard of hearing students. This book is a pretty easy read, and it's it covers kind of the gamut from young children up to adolescent readers, and it goes over each part of reading, so you can learn about kind of the current state. Um, the book is being rewritten right now because it's almost 10 years old. So there'll be a newer version out soon, but it's a good place to start if you just want an easy read and learn about different strategies for different parts of reading and the sub skills, or just kind of the current state of research in reading for deaf and hard of hearing students. It does cover writing as well, but I feel like it's more, probably more in depth about reading itself. So reading has sub skills, of course. And these are the sub skills for older readers. It changes from the time that they are younger to the time that they come to us. So what's really different is that phonological skill, all the phonological awareness skills, those skills plateau around third and fourth grade, and they don't really help as much towards reading because if you're, if you're learning to read on a uh, typical trajectory, then your phonological processing skills are going to kind of become less important. And those morphology or word part skills, which is part of word study that you'll see there on that pie, become more important. So that's, that's why it might look different to you than maybe a, a literacy um, graphic that you've seen in the past. Also, you'll see here the one piece of literacy or reading that we often leave out, which is motivation. It's left out for one of basic reason. We don't know how to measure it. And on top of that, we don't know if it's something that can be taught. So because of that, most of the time people don't talk about motivation because maybe that's something that we don't have any control over as teachers. Um, so today what we're gonna talk about is vocabulary, that one little gray piece there. Vocabulary kind of has two definitions or two ways that you can interpret what vocabulary means. And we're going to really talk about that first definition of meaning of the words while you're reading. So while a student's reading, they come to a word that they see and can they, do they know the meaning of that word? Another piece of vocabulary is really tied to decoding. It's more of that sound out portion of vocabulary. So um, often something that our students can't take advantage of as, as uh, easily as a typical hearing child, because if they are sounding out a word, they may have never heard that word or they don't hear it the way that other children hear it. So it's not really the most helpful way for them to learn vocabulary, but it is a different route. Um, and so, but today we're really going to focus on that meaning piece and making meaning. So just to give you a definition of vocabulary so that we're all on the same page, because vocabulary obviously can mean different things. Today we are talking about that storehouse of words and their meaning that students use to plan expressive language, understand receptive language, and to comprehend a text. I think most often, you know, here we are often talking about text comprehension, but we also have to understand that vocabulary is part of language as well. So just to give some background information, what happens with typical hearing children? They tend to start on a trajectory for vocabulary learning and they stay on that trajectory. So if they're just, if they're going along, they keep going. They don't go along and plateau. They don't go along and drop off. They typically just keep growing and growing and growing and growing. Most second graders have about 6,000 root words. So when they come to second grade, they've got about 6,000 root words to work from. And that's a big part of, because second grade is where you start to look into those word parts, affixes, um, root words to make new words. So remember we talked about the phonological skills, the benefit of those drop off or plateau, plateau around third grade. And that's where you're seeing that switch from phonological skills and phonological decoding to more of a um, looking at the word parts and decoding that way because as you become more and more of a skilled reader you read in bigger bigger chunks right at first you read letter to letter then you might read full word and as you become if you as you start to get to the discipline areas you have those really long words that are made up of several affixes and a root you might look at the affixes and the root 
Then over time, you're looking at a phrase, you're looking at a sentence. So the long, the chunks when you're reading get bigger and bigger. And the portion, and the what's important about that is it frees up your cognitive faculties in order to think about or to understand what you're reading because not all of your energy is being spent on that letter to letter reading. A lot of our students are still doing that. So they might still be using that letter to letter reading and that eats up a lot of their cognitive resources. Therefore, they don't have much left to actually put it all together in a phrase, put it all together in a sentence or put it all together over a passage and understand what that whole passage was about because they're using all of their cognitive resources on that letter to letter. So what we wanna do is move them from that to reading larger chunks of text. And by the time you get to our level, you almost, it's almost like you're not really reading, you know, unless we get to a word we don't know, we're almost reading, the, the decoding part of it is almost subconscious. We're really just, you know, reading at a very, multiple sentence level or whatever the case may be until we get to the point where we realize we don't understand or we find a word we don't know. A kid in 10th grade is going to have about 10,000 words and that's going to be 10,000 what we would consider internalized words meaning they know what they mean and they can use them in a sentence so it's part of their own vocabulary. Um, Students pick up words all the time that never maybe become part. We do it too. Everybody does. But we pick up words that don't become part of our vocabulary. We might hear it or see it once or twice. And if we're not using it, if we're not putting it into our own language, that word just goes away over time. And what you hear often is vocabulary predicts reading outcomes. And that is true. That's true for hearing kids. That's true for deaf kids. Vocabulary the amount of vocabulary that you have or know will predict your reading outcome. But what is a better predictor is what they call decontextualized vocabulary. So decontextualized vocabulary is when a, a, your, your child comes home and says, oh, well, at school today, I, um, I played on the playground with Marcus and he got mad at me because I accidentally kicked him. I didn't mean to. Gives you this whole story where you weren't there and it's not happening right now. So that's called decontextualized. It's happened at another time, it happened in another place and your child held that information, brought it home and started to tell you about it. That's huge because the two of you don't have a shared understanding at that moment because you didn't see it happen. You weren't there. So your child is telling you this or your child might tell you about something they've read or a student in your class might tell you about something that happened in the dorm over the weekend. All of that is decontextualized vocabulary. And that is the, the most significant and accurate predictor of reading because it's, it's actually being able to take something in and bring it to someone else or another space or another time and tell that person about it. And that can be really difficult. I'm sure you've seen potentially in your classroom where a student's trying to tell you about something that happened over the weekend or potentially last year. And it's really hard for you to tell, um, you know, is that happening? Did that just happen yesterday? Did that happen two years ago? Is this a friend of yours you're talking about? Is this a brother you're talking about? All of that decontextualized language that doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes because our students may not give us enough information or not enough labels, that piece is really, really critical to reading outcomes. And it's also a big part of just language in general. I mean, if we do this all the time, right? We tell stories all the time. So just like hearing kids, for deaf and hard of hearing kids, once they're on a vocabulary trajectory, they tend to stay on that trajectory. So whatever it is, they just keep going. They don't really plateau, they don't fall off, you know, just, they just kind of keep going. Before school starts, so in the early years, deaf and hard of hearing kids can have one fifth the vocabulary of a typical hearing child. And that's really um, concerning because that, gap doesn't seem to close. And I'll show you a study that looked at that. We don't seem to be able to, it seems to widen and, it, and we don't seem to be able to close that gap. Why is this happening? We know that our students can get limited input for different reasons. It could be that they have 
you know, hearing technology, but it's not given in full access to spoken language. Therefore, they're catching some things, but not others. It could be that they should be accessing sign language and they're not getting that in all of their settings or any of their settings potentially. Um, it could be that there is a disability there that, you know, maybe is creating a more challenging condition in order to learn from the input that's coming in. So if you have a limited input, if what you're getting is limited, then obviously what you're learning is going to be different. We know that a lot of our kids suffer from or have poor, uh, poor parental communication. Uh, that's not a surprise to anybody, I don't think. But there also is the, even if their parents do sign, there has to be, you know, that attention to the sign language. So potentially a, stu a child who, especially it could happen when you have maybe deaf, their parents are deaf, but they are, their, pa their parents were hearing, so grandparents are hearing and maybe weren't aware of appropriate attention getting strategies for young children. So then the deaf parents, even if they sign, if they don't use those appropriate attention getting strategies, you're going to see that have a similar effect. And then also that inability to overhear conversations. So just the amount of vocabulary that's coming in from the environment is going to have an effect on vocabulary learning. So that's a big part of, um, I know, um, all of a sudden the name is escaping me, I'm sorry. Mindy Hopper's work with incidental learning, that's a big piece of that. All of those words that our kids are just hearing our hearing kids are hearing over and over and over again, and eventually just from hearing them over and over and over again in different examples of language or sentences, they can learn what that word means. But our children who are deaf and hard of hearing may not get that many, the same number of opportunities. And then um, just like hearing kids, their vocabulary is a predictor and that predictor remains. So even young deaf children, if you look at their vocabulary, it's a predictor of their reading. About middle school, same thing college, same thing. And then we see for many populations, not just deaf and hard of hearing populations, but also for students with disabilities, there's a what we call a fall off from that learning to read to reading to learn, um, which happens usually around the third or fourth grade. So even with implants, even with technology, in place, if a student, if a deaf and hard of hearing student and the research is bearing this out, shows up at kindergarten, first grade with age equivalent reading or age equivalent language to their typical hearing peers, they might still experience this fall off in the third or fourth grade because you have to go from learning how to read to learning from what you read. And that's a big switch. What also happens is that up until about third or fourth grade, you're reading a lot of stories and narrative and um, kind of, you know, fairy tales and tall tales and all those things. Now, all of a sudden, fourth, fifth grade, you're going to start reading, you know, kind of early elementary textbooks. So a lot of the nonfiction reading, the discipline based reading starts in that age range. Another thing that happens and this is why we see this, we see this effect also happen in deaf children of deaf parents, is that the language of the home is very much the language of the classroom in kindergarten through third, fourth grade, right? You're, ta you're talking about similar topics. And then fifth, sixth, seventh, the language of the classroom, academic language, is not the language of the home anymore. We're not sitting at home talking about um, the you know, science topics, I'm trying to think of one all of a sudden. You're not sitting at home talking about constellations or asteroids or comets, the same way that's happening in the classroom. So the, the language where the language of the home was supporting the language of the classroom, now the language of the home and the language of the classroom are different. So a lot of times without actively making sure that we're supporting the academic language at home, it, it doesn't really happen the same. So this is that graph I was telling you about. This actually says university. I don't know why it's cut off. I apologize. Um, so essentially, this is saying that if at two at a, at two years, if one child has three hundred words and one child has one hundred and fifty words, that that's that. See how that gap is growing as you go along. So this trajectory is staying on the same path. This trajectory is going on its path, but it's just gap getting wider and wider. 
and that's what happens for our students um, if they don't hit you know kindergarten with that appropriate number of words then they're already at a disadvantage um, and we do I had a thought but it left me we do know that this is where early intervention and all of those kind of services come into play and how they can really be helpful however we still at least in the state of new york are losing 50 percent of our kids from um, newborn hearing screening to early intervention so we find out they have a hearing loss but they never make it to the educational piece of get, getting services to kind of prevent something like this where they would show up with half the vocabulary of a, of a child at a different of a child with typical hearing so we're going to talk about two different types of words most of the things that we'll talk about as we go along will be to learn these lexical words because that's a big piece of what we do in disciplines is teaching the terminology for your fields so lexical words are words that have specific meanings they're most of the words that we use right they are the building blocks of sentences so they give us kind of the meaning of the sentence basically like the content of the sentence and there's a limit limitless number of these words and the reason why it's limitless is because in order as you know for languages to be a language they have to be dynamic and ever-changing so limitless means that we're going to be adding words to the English language to American Sign Language for the rest of eternity right as long as those languages are considered um, live languages so we every year we have different words added to American Sign Language and to English a good example would be the word selfie didn't exist to most of us many you know so many years ago and now it has an English word it has a sign um, Instagram didn't exist now it has a word it has a sign and there's those type, that's how it is lexical, how lexical, the lexical group of words is limitless. Then there's functional words. Functional words are the ones that they're so difficult because they don't really hold any meaning such as of, for, um, the, a, we can give them meaning, we can talk about why you use one or the other, but do they really themselves hold a meaning, a definition? They don't. However, they hold our sentences together in a meaningful way. For example, so when you're thinking about those lexical words that are in there giving you that content, you need the functional words to tell us how those content words relate to each other. That makes sense. And they typically are parts of grammar. So those, and they have to, we have to as teachers teach both of them. Now the lexical part I think is a bit easier, at least to me as a teacher of the deaf. Functional words are a bit harder because of that piece. A, a lot of them don't exist. Um, they they do exist in sign language. However, they may not actually be a lexical sign. It could be a non-manual marker, which we know a lot of our kids overlook. And so they're not as salient as say a printed word like the versus a. other challenges with vocabulary we have sight words so they are typically functional words like we just talked about and they don't have they don't follow decoding strategies so you can't learn you can't learn them from decoding them you have to learn just by memorizing them and you'd be surprised how many they are so just within the pre-k and k curriculum there's over 200 sight words for kids to learn and that's words um, signs it's all 300 plus because of the fact that a lot of them have multiple meanings. So that's our next challenge. Um, we have words that have multiple meanings. They have multiple signs. And our children most often when they're reading, they'll just pick the first one that they learned. So they won't really look at the word and say, well, it doesn't really you know, make sense in this sentence. They'll just pick that first meaning and go with it. And we have figurative language. So we have figurative language in English, we have figurative language in American Sign Language. And this is a big part that shows up, you know, as they age, they can get three to four years behind in figurative language because it is unique to each language that you're learning or each language that you know. And obviously you can't use the concrete meaning to understand what someone is um, mentioning by this. And they're also, you know, related to culture. So if you weren't a part of that culture growing up, 
you also might see issues in figurative language. And then also we have issues with testing languages. So we have do so much standardized testing these days and we do, you know, even testing at this level, um, there's a lot of abstract words in there. And there's often times that for our kids, what we think is a reading comprehension measure ends up being a vocabulary measure or what we think is a English, you know, looking at English sentence structure actually becomes a vocabulary issue because they don't have the words, they don't have the vocabulary to even tackle next the grammar, right? So a lot of our tests, like we've talked about, you know, the struggle with math can be the math language piece of it. If our kids can just see the problem, they can work it out. But when you add the language piece, it becomes more challenging. When we get to this age, so our college, you know, incoming college freshmen and college students, we have content area reading vocabulary. So this presentation is about content area stuff, meaning content area, that term means things, words, or strategies that can go across a content, across different contents, meaning you could use this in math, you could use this in science, you could use this in engineering. And then the next presentation is about strategies that are specifically for science and science-based um, disciplines. And then the third presentation is about strategies specific to math and math-based math disciplines. So this one, that's where you hear discipline, right? That's the difference. Content area means general, kind of overall, and discipline means specific, the specific area. So in general, content area vocabulary is more difficult than what we call literary vocabulary or the vocabulary of stories, which we all experience. And the, uh, the biggest way that we can improve our students' comprehension of these content area readings is direct instruction on vocabulary. And we do know that even that has you know, limitations because we can't teach them every word they need to know. But the more direct instruction that we do, the better off we are. And when you get to content area, um, words are often labels for concepts. So one, you know, one concept may not have a single word that really um, applies to it because we're really talking about, you know, the concepts within science, you know, talking about um, what have I been working on lately, been looking at, you know, um, acceleration as a vector. Well, that's a whole concept. There's a lot of stuff within that that are parts of that, right? Um, so that's where the concept starts to represent, represent more than just that one word that we're giving the students. So when we're talking about more, more about content area vocabulary, this is where things really change. Words that, if you're reading a story, you can have a kind of foundational understanding of that word. You don't have to have an in-depth understanding of that word in order to be able to continue reading and understand most of what the story was about. But when you get to content area, that's not true anymore. You actually have to have this level four, very intense understanding of the word in order to understand the passage that you're about to read. So it gets the level of understanding of each word, kind of the depth of understanding of those words gets a lot more intense as we go into the content areas. Another piece is that we are working, if you've ever attended any of my presentations before, you've seen this. Um, we've stopped working so much in those tier two words, so the academic words that we see in every field, such as analyze, compare and contrast, identify, those are academic vocabulary tier two words. We start to really look at this domain three or the tier three domain specific words. These are words that are specific to your discipline, such as acceleration, um, and what that means specifically to physics, which might mean something different in another field. Um, uh, gr uh, friction, which means some, you know, kinetic friction, all of those really specific words that mean something very specific to that field that you're reading about or talking about at the time. The issue with those words <laughs> is that we don't see them a lot because we're only reading or only seeing them in that domain. And we don't use them a lot. 
So they're not part of our everyday. I don't go out and talk to my friends about friction. And even when I'm using it with my friends, it's probably not meaning the friction as is part of physics. It might mean, oh, those two people seem to be having friction as in not getting along, right? So we can kind of see where this gets complicated. So our students aren't getting as many opportunities to see the word or use the word, but they have to know the word in depth to understand what they're reading or learning. The other issue is that all of a sudden these common words, common everyday words that they thought they understood, like table, and you can see the furniture item table, becomes table like graph or display. So we have to explain to them that this was table, yes, you're right, that, but in this context, it means this other thing. And they have to be able to make that adjustment eventually without us, obviously. Now we're gonna go into teaching strategies. I tried to, the best I could, if I have a strategy, I try to give you an example. But of course, if you look at any of these and think, I would like to know more about that, or I'm not quite sure how I would actually do it, please for, um, feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to work with you with your own vocabulary words in your class to try to work with one of these strategies. So one thing that we can do is help our students acquire meaning and there's different ways we can do that. So we can use a knowledge model, which means we take that word that they need to know and we're putting it in multiple contexts and we're repeating it. So one of the big things about language acquisition is that you usually hear and see a word or see a word signed many times before you're gonna use it. So if you had a word that, or several words that you knew were coming up that you wanted to teach, the more that you can introduce that word in just your lecture or your email or whatever, even if you're just exposing them to it, the better off you'll be. And another thing that you can do with that word is try to connect it to an experience. So if you had the word severe and we you know, connect it to, oh, remember that time that you um, fell off that electric scooter and had a big old cut on your face? That was kind of severe or it was not severe, whatever you wanna say. The more that we can use this kind of in a natural way it, it lends to the natural way that we learn language. So really that it's very, very purposeful. And I know it takes a lot of thinking, but if you know you have a word coming up in three weeks that is gonna be part of something, a, a lab that they're gonna be doing or a reading that they're gonna be doing, you can start introducing that word just in context, just in conversation, way before they actually are gonna to have to need to know it. Another thing we can do is give kind of definitions in context. So here again, we have the word severe and the way that we help them kind of see what is that, what severe means is we give them, you know, a, a kind of a scenario, right? So he had a severe hair, head injury and he may not be able to speak again. So we're not giving them a definition. We're not saying he had a severe head injury comma, blah, 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 the exact definition of severe. No, we're relating it back to something where the student would know, oh, okay, that's severe. If someone hurts their head enough that they can't speak or they're not gonna be able to walk again, I see the seriousness of that. So it's not really giving them a definition. Definitions sometimes are not terribly helpful, especially depending on the <laughs> level that those definitions are written at. So. Things like this where we can connect it back to their life or something that they're familiar with can really help. We can do explicit instruction and I encourage you to do explicit instruction of vocabulary, but I would encourage you to make sure that you're teaching all the components of the word. So yes, you know, a student, um, a student definition that's worded in their own words is important and is, it will help. Uh, a definition copied out of a book is not really going to help that much. A definition copied out of the dictionary is not really going to help that much. They really need to put it in their own words. But then also talking about multiple meanings of the words, what words mean the same and different, so synonyms, antonyms, examples and non-examples, and what we call connections to real world. So that's what we were just discussing, trying to find a way to connect that word to something they already know or have experienced. This is just an example of like a word study um, that would be about one word. And I, I do understand that this is a lot as you think about, oh, I have to do all of this for every vocabulary word. 
it would be nice if you did. <laughs> I know it's, it's sometimes it feels a little impossible, but this is kind of the depth and breadth that they are the depth, take out breadth, I'm sorry, the depth of a word, the meaning of a word that they need to know in order to use it in your classroom. So it is quite important. And the, the link's down there if you wanted to pull this sheet down and look at it. Again, with the tiers, you're most likely going to be leading teaching at that tier three level. So you're going to be teaching those content specific words, but understand that our students may also be struggling with those tier two words, synthesis, analyze, compare and contrast, identify. So those type words, our students still may not exactly know what they mean. So we also might need to be teaching a little bit at that level. And then there's even tier one words. There's everyday words that our students may not know. And so we have to be aware of all tiers. Now, sometimes you can use, you know, a tier one to teach a tier two to teach a tier one or use like, for example, um, you could say this is probably for a younger child, but, you know, uh, the cat is furry. The cat has a lot of hair. The cat is furry. So maybe they didn't know the word furry, but they do know hair. Hair is more of a common everyday word. So we can attach those two things and hopefully take advantage of both of them as we're trying to teach them furry. We also need to talk, uh, teach at different processing levels. So we need to we need to help them associate and connect a new word to something they already know. So the example we have here is this is analog technology. You know, be showing you know something and say, oh, well, this is, this uses, this is analog technology. And you can say, oh, remember you told me the cameras were old school? Well, analog technology is old school. So kids might use that term. They have a concept for what it means. And then you can add the information of not processing numbers like a computer does. And that's you know actually what analog means. So giving them that new word analog and connecting to something that they already know or something they previously said will help them connect the two things together. We also want to do a comprehension processing. So we want them to be able to categorize whatever they're learning in a new way, potentially. So for example, you could say we use the word bug to mean programming error. So that's in computer sciences, obviously, and then helping them categorize it. It's not an insect. So they can take that word bug and not go straight back to their picture in their head of an insect. When we're talking about computers, it means this other thing. So helping them know where to stick it. Where does it go in these categories that they have inside their head? Because that's one of the biggest things for our students is sometimes the words go into the wrong category when their brain is organizing it. So then when they go to retrieve it, it's much harder to retrieve if you are looking in the wrong file cabinet, so to speak, in your brain. And I think we probably all know what this look feels like when you pull a word and all of a sudden you're like, wait, 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 I know that's not the meaning that I was trying to get, but, but it, we just went for the wrong meaning when our brain went to retrieve that word. Now for us, we can a lot of times notice, oh, wait, that's not the word that that person meant. They were, they were this other meaning for that word. We pick up on it. Sometimes our students don't. Sometimes they just go with whatever they pull and then they have this miscomprehension or misunderstanding throughout your whole lesson, sometimes throughout your whole class. And they don't know how to say, wait a minute, I'm picking, I'm pulling the wrong meaning for this word. Obviously, you mean something else. And then if we want to be sure that they get a new category for a word. So, you know, saying, so we're here like Ethernet versus Internet, you know, you're right. So maybe they, we were talking about something, you're right. The Ethernet is like the Internet, but it's a restricted network. So we're giving them a whole new category they have to think about. You have the Internet. Awesome. Put that away. Now we're going to create this new thing about Ethernet and we're going to talk about the things within that category. So we want to have all these levels of processing while we're doing something. And as you can see, none of this is like rote memorization. None of this is, you know, writing a word five times as you probably did as a child. All of this is using language and going and having interactions with us as faculty or the you know people the more knowledgeable other as um Vygotsky would put it in the students learning environment whoever that is one big thing is if we can relate vocabulary words back to the students experiences we can have those discussions about the multiple meanings we also can provide multiple exposures so if you've run a lab 
you know, with the students and they've, they've already experienced it, going back and talking about it, relating back and forth to that lab or relating back and forth to that experience, really connecting that experience to the words can be a big part of them learning that vocabulary. Um, and another thing that you can do is they call it elaborative reminiscing. So that's the concept of, so remember when we did this experiment and then start to talk about the experiment, integrating the vocabulary. When I said this word, it was actually connected to this particular piece of lab equipment, or it was connected to this particular portion of the lab. That was what you, you saw was a chemical interaction or whatever you're trying to get them to learn. So it's taking something that they've already experienced and reinforcing all of that with language. Um, you can also, for young kids, a lot of times we do this, you can take pictures while they're doing the experience and that helps. So you can bring up the picture of the lab and say, so when you were doing this, you know, this, this lab equipment was called this, you were integrating this safety skill. So you have kind of them pictured there doing the actual activity and you can refer back to it. Obviously this will grow language, not just vocabulary, but it is a vocabulary strategy. You also can pre-teach. This is a really common strategy that we see a lot of pre-teaching. Um, you need to determine what words they might not know. You need to find a quick way to assess that so that you're not teaching them words that they already know. So you, you know, for example, if I give out everybody in the class 10 words, there might be a kid that already knows eight of them. Well, I'm not benefiting him that much. But if I find 40 words, then I'm probably gonna be able to find at least 10 words for everybody that everybody doesn't know. And then I'm benefiting them a little more um, in a greater way. And they don't have to have the same words. You know, your students can have different words based on um, their levels. You can have different words based on what they seem interested. I mean, however you wanna do it, but you can have different words for different kids. That's not a big deal. Then you wanna teach those words and then you wanna assess. So you're gonna keep, you know, a log of what they have learned along the way. One thing that's interesting is, you know, how long do they keep those words? So if you teach a word in the first week that they don't see again until the third week, are they going to be able to hold it to the third week? So it would be interesting to know. That's one thing that you can learn from things like this is how long do they hold words? How long are the words still in their brain for maybe they swap it out for something else or, you know, they just forget it. Because a lot of our kids, I think, do a lot of memorization for <laughs> quick uh for vocabulary tests and things like that. If you can teach the words in a, a category, 10 words that are related to X, I don't know what you, whatever you're teaching, that will help because they kind of have a way to organize that, those words in their head. Or if you can teach them in relation to something they already know. So if you, you know, say you're gonna teach um, heliograph, so helio, you know, meaning sun, are there other words with helio in it that you could use to teach, to, you know, kind of capitalize on that one um, affix or root and teach a family of words? So if you're teaching figurative language, please do not teach the cute, what it act, you know, the I'm all tied up right now. Don't teach the I'm all tied up part. Just ignore that part because our kids can get stuck on that. Um, we want to teach what it actually means. We want to teach what it semantically means because of this concept of fossilized vocabulary. So our kids typically, whatever that first meaning is that goes in, that's the one that they will rely on over and over and over again. Remember we talked about them um, rely, when they had a multiple meaning word, they rely on that first meaning that they learned. That's this concept of fossilized vocabulary. So we don't want to teach them the cutesy part meaning. We want to teach them the actual meaning. As always, visual materials are helpful when learning vocabulary. So pictures, if you're going to use pictures, try to use multiple pictures of the same concept so that they don't get stuck on well, that is what that particular, you know, I mean, for instance, if you were doing evergreens, I don't know if anybody teaches that, but <laughs> evergreens. You wouldn't want to just pick one evergreen tree and say, well, this is an evergreen. You want to pick multiple pictures of different evergreens so they could understand that evergreen is more of a category. And it could be all of these things. It could be all of these different types. And it has these characteristics, right? There's a um, 
a curriculum out there called visualizing and verbalizing and i'm not saying you go buy this curriculum but it has these 12 elements and it'll, it'll if you're teaching something it'll the 12 question it has 12 questions that you ask about okay so if i'm visualizing this particular um character you know what do they look like what do they smell like what color do I see most of? So it helps to, if you're asking the students to visualize something, if you have, if you think visualization would help them understand what you're teaching them, it gives you 12 questions that you can add to that visualization to have the students kind of fill in those blanks. So if I ask my students, okay, visualize a middle school deaf ed classroom. What do you think it looks like? What do you think it, Feel, what do you think the kind of energy in their room would be? What do you think? So it's all of these things that help them fill in that visualization and I can actually get you the 12 elements. I should have put them in here and I can give them to hope. So it, it helps with not just having kind of a flat, maybe black and white visualization of what you're talking about, but fills it in. And then also you're constantly modeling vocabulary. You can use word journals in your classroom Word journals are kind of like a word wall that you might see in younger grades. Um, however, a word journal is awesome, but it can just be a place that words show up, right? You actually have to use it. So we'd ha you'd have to have activities with the word journal. You'd have to prompt the students, hey, you want to pull out your word journal? They're probably going to find the answer in there. You're going to, have to use a lot. You're going to, have to show them how to use it. There's a good chance that you could start using a word journal and the kids just don't even know what to do with it. So that's going to be part of your teaching is okay. So, you know, when you, some people do, um, what are they called? The note taking for the classes that have the sentence in the blank. And so the students like pay attention to the lecture and then they might fill in the blanks and it's kind of a way to keep they're not taking notes as much, but it keeps them engaged with the lecture because they have to fill in those blanks. Close activities, yes. Um, you would have to show them how to get from those notes that you give out that they are filling in to how would they use their word journal if they didn't, if they missed one of the words? Or how would they use their word journal if they're reading along and they find a word they don't know, but it's in their word journal? So you'd have to show them how to use these things. I'll show you an example of a word journal page. It's just an example. So this is for the word stationary. You can see that they have a word sentence. How how the student what the student wants the thinks the word means. You can use the dictionary if you'd like to. Then they need to put a new sentence. So there has to be generation. There has to be something that the student generates on this page. If they find the definition, which is okay, it's not the best, but it's okay. The next step would be, can they put it in their own words? If they can't put it in their own words, then it's not going to do much good. And then, you know, they can have a picture. This has a, um, a word will or concept will. We'll talk a little bit more of those later, but it's, she, if you have the word stationary, it's coming up with other words that are connected to that word. So letter writing, envelope, stamps. Kind of gives them almost synonyms or things that are in the same concept or family. This is just an example. There's tons of other um, word journals out there. This is just an idea. You can also use word parts to teach vocabulary. So morphemes, of course, the smallest part of language that still holds a meaning. You, you yourself can look up the word and on, it'll give you oftentimes um, in the dictionary, it'll give you the breakdown. It'll also give you what the morphemes mean. So you can use that to help you teach. So it's, you can teach them how to break down the words. How do you look to see what morphemes might be in that word? Then you can talk about the meanings of those morphemes and then how do they put them back together? And then how do they, now that I've put it back together and I have a definition, it's not gonna be perfect. How do I put that back into a sentence and make sure that I'm talking about the right word or the right meaning? Oops, I skipped, sorry. This is one way you can teach it. This is a, uh, it's called word detectives. I don't ever tell students it's word detectives. I just tell them we're learning, you know, um, word parts and that's worked fine for college level all the way down to like fourth or fifth grade. You break up the word for them, showing them how it's broken up. You define it, you'd find the parts. They put it back together. 
you talk about other words that might have the same um, morphemes so that you can talk about, oh, yes, that has the same morpheme, but that's not exactly the same meaning. Gives you time to kind of talk through it so they understand that this is not a foolproof way to do things, but it is one tool. And then you, there's um, rules that you can learn and teach the students about how words are broken apart and put together in the English language. You also can do something like this, which is a graphic organizer. So you have transported and you know, trans and imported, and then it has the um, words on the side that are related to it. The words with the plus signs are related. The words with the question mark are not related. So even though it has the ED in it, it doesn't mean um, past tense, obviously. You also can teach kids how to use context clues, but we really have to teach this part. So I'm gonna give you five context clues that you can teach pretty simply. You can teach them to look directly after the word. So sometimes right after the word or the phrase, the meaning is there. So what you have here, the example is haberdashery, which is a store that sells men's clothing. So there's your meaning is, a, or is becoming more common today. So it's already in the sentence. And the name of that context clue is definition or explanation. So each of the context clues have their own label. And you would have to teach, make sure they know how to do these things. Um, we can assume, we tell them all the time, use the word, you know, use your context clues, but do they even know how to? Do they know what that means? Or they might tell you they're using, using context clues, but they may only know one strategy. So a restatement or a synonym could be in the sentence. So here we have, Lou was sent to the haberdashery to find a new suit. He needed to wear one for his uncle's wedding. So it's the, the part where it says to find a new suit should help the student understand that haberdashery is where men's clothes are sold, or at least where clothes are sold, or at least where suits are sold, right? So it gives them a little bit of an idea. There's also antonyms or a contrast. So similar to the one before, but this one is an antonym. Lou, which is not similar. Why did I just say that? Anyway, Lou wanted to go to the haberdashery, but Anne wanted to shop at the boutique. So it gives you but. So no, now you know that boutique and haberdashery are probably opposites of each other. So if you have an idea of what a boutique is, it would give you an idea of what haberdashery is. Now understand, a lot of times our kids are going to be struggling at that vocabulary level. So we're going to need to make sure that say, okay, well, do you know what a boutique is? See if they can explain it. And then say, well, what would be different than that? What would be the opposite piece? You also can have inference for general information. So a lot of times we'll say, you know, look at the word, look at the sentence that it's in, look at the sentence behind it, look at the sentence in front of it. So they're going to have to read that whole section and kind of infer what me what the meaning is. Um, so here, the inference is in that second sentence, right? He loved to, he loved shopping for nice suits. So that's giving us an idea of what is sold at a haberdashery, which is mentioned in the first sentence. And the last one is punctuation. And this is probably the one our students is, are most familiar with because maybe it's the easiest one, is to look through the whole sentence. Are there commas? Are there parentheses, are there dashes, are there some sort of punctuation that might give you an idea that the word meaning is going to be within that punctuation or after, after that um, punctuation. Italics also is a part of that. So we can teach them to look for these in um, books. I would also recommend, especially if you're using textbooks, I've run into kids who still don't understand that bolded words or italicized words in their textbooks are actually vocabulary words for that textbook. Um, I, I worked with a student who all they had to do for the teacher was the, you know, they had the word, the word on a pay, page and the, all they had to do is look through their textbook and the words were defined in the margin. They were right there. But the kid had never, I said, well, wait, 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 it's right here. That, see right there? The student never understood that it was defined right there in the margin and that's what the teacher was looking for. So even though it wasn't the best vocabulary learning activity because how much you're gonna learn from copying a definition, it also was our kid was, our students were just at a disadvantage because they just didn't understand that the definition was right there. 
So that was kind of something like hit me. We need to really um, be sure they understand how their textbooks work, whether they're online or in print, and that they understand what those text features are within the textbook. That a lot of times a bolded word will be a vocabulary word or an important word. We can use visual graphic organizers. So these are some examples. The first one is just your typical word web with diet in the middle. The second one is called a Frayer model, F-R-A-Y-E-R. And it's used a lot in math. And it gives characteristics, definitions, examples, non-examples of the word in the middle. Um, you see it more in math and sciences is where you'll see the Frayer model. Um, but how do you use a visual organizer? is more important than the actual visual organizer that you use. So as a teacher, you need to look at what they need to be reading and list the words that you think are important. Then look, then take your words and put them in a hierarchy. So what words do I think are the most important for them to know and down to least important? And then what do you think out of those words your students might know, might not know? Find an organizer that works for those words. So the last example was a word web. Not every organized, not every word is going to be conducive to a word web, right? Mm -hmm. Some words are going to be more conducive to that Freyer model. Um, then use the graphic organizer with your students. So you're going to have to show them how to use it because they might have an experience with tons of graphic organizers. But they have no idea like how you're really using them and what they're really for. So you're gonna have to model over and over and over again, how to use this graphic organizer. If I get to this word, then I wanna use a word web, then this is how I do that thing. And then once you complete that graphic organizer, put it somewhere and go back to it, refer to it. Why is it important? Why was it helpful? Why did it, why are we even doing this? A lot of times kids fill out a graphic organizer, that's it. It's never reviewed, it's never come back to, they don't know, so, What's the point? We're kind of wasting their time. So if you say, if you get a new word, if they get a new word and you say, okay, here's three graphic organizers we've been using all semester, which one do you think would help you the most? And then they can work through, oh, I think it's the, I think the Freyer model would help me the most. Okay. They get the Freyer model, they start working it out, but then, you know, that's where the word journal comes in, into play. They could put that in their word journal. That word comes up again. You can say, well, I'm pretty sure that word's in your word journal, or well, let's look in our word journal first. And then it becomes part of a routine and they start to understand how you use these tools to actually help you. Another thing you can do is called word exploration. So you can give students a word or two that, that you know, let's say you're starting a lesson and you just give them two words from your lesson and give them five minutes to write everything they know about that word. So tell them, don't worry about spelling, don't worry about grammar, punctuation, nothing. Just tell me everything you know about this word and then have the students go around and tell each other what they know about that word. So it, it, it's kind of, a, it, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the most low risk activity because they are having to say, this is what I know about this word and potentially I don't know as much as the person next to me. So that does make it a risk for our students in that way. However, it also is just kind of a free write. It's a free write, it's a free sign, however you wanna do it, it's not really important what um, medium or modality it's that they're really pulling forth everything they can think of to go with that topic or to go with that um, vocabulary word. It's a good way to prime something if you're about to teach something new. So you're about to teach some new words related to that topic. You can kind of prime that. Here's an example. So, so you could say, write everything you know about natural selection. So they just write everything they know about it. You have five minutes just writing, brainstorming. You know, they might come up with even if they just make, they just write words around it. Darwin, um, you know, they don't have to write complete thoughts, just whatever comes to their head. And then they share it with each other. So then they're learning from each other um, and they are kind of being praised for what they do know rather than whether or not what they know is something they can write out perfectly. Here's another idea, it's called list group label. So you give them a concept and they list as many words as they know related to that concept. So just words, it doesn't have to be phrases. I mean, it can be two words if they have to, but typically just words. Then they take all the words that they've come up with, 
And in groups, they try to put the words that they came up with related to the first topic into groups themselves or categorize their words. Then they take those categories and they label them. And then you as the teacher say, how did you decide what the label of your group would be? So you have this category here. Why did you label it this particular thing? Um, why did you decide to put these words together and, and not put these words with it? This can really help you, especially if you're getting ready to teach a new set of words or a new concept with vocabulary. This can really help you to see what they already know about the words and how they're categorizing them in their head. So they could be putting them together in a completely unorganized fashion, or they don't even know how to organize them. And that will show you a lot about how much you're going to have to help them categorize those words and put words that go together together. And then you can have them write a sentence or a paragraph using the words if you want to. I do this a lot of times with post-it notes, have them write one word, post-it note, post-it note, post-it note, and then they can move the post-it notes around into the categories. Just something a little more fun than always writing on paper or whatever. So this is an example. So just give them, you know, let's say the topic was just write every word, all the words you know with about plants. And they went through and wrote all these words. So then they have words that are connected to seeds, words that are connected to things that grow, things that dr or drink and breathe these things or plant needs. So they come up with all these words, just in a big old list, and then they're putting them in these categories, then they label them, and then they tell you why. And the big piece of this is telling you why. That's where you can see sometimes some breakdowns of understanding that you might not have been aware of otherwise. Another thing that you can do, and this can be before you teach words or after you teach them, either way, is these open or word sorts, but there's two different types, open sorts and closed sorts. So an open sort would mean that you give the students the words and they have to group them based on some characteristic that they come up with. Or closed sort means you give them the group names and the words and they have to figure out which word goes into which group. You can do this for different purposes. The biggest piece of this also would be to ask why. So why did you put these words together in this group and create a group with these words? Or why did you choose to put these words in this particular category? So they can tell you. And when they're telling you why they made those choices, that's where you can see either they don't understand the meaning of the words, they kind of do, but maybe it's not quite right, or they're really off base, or they understand it perfectly and they can explain it to you. Just remember those category connections are really huge when it comes to trying to retrieve a word. One of the, you know, one of the things that we have to think about is our kids when they go into a science classroom, they kind of have to put on their scientist brain, right? And all of the, uh, the organization, their brain kind of needs to head, kind of go towards that science path so that they can pull forth the right words as you're signing them or as they're reading them. This is just an example. This would be a closed sort because the, but it doesn't really tell you how you're sorting them, but you know, it has recopy, preview, invest. So you might say, put the words together that are similar. You would hope that the student would understand that the ensure, ingrown, those are gonna go with the in affix. So this would be a closed sort. You also could just give them these words without those top three and see if they figure out how to sort them, especially if you've been talking about these three um, prefixes. You also can do knowledge rating. So this is before reading, you would have the students fill out a rating form about what they know about words. I'll show you a um, example. They're gonna rate how much they know about that word and then you're gonna talk to them. So which of these words do you think are the hardest? Which ones do you think most of you already know or don't know? Um, and you can also say, well, you, you said you know nothing about this word. So you, you know, or you sh you've never seen this word before. You've never seen parts of this word before. Let me show you what that looks like. So you have on the side, you have all the words that you picked. And then you have, I know this word well. I've seen it or I've heard it. I have no clue what it means. So they can give you an idea of what they think. 
Now understand there's a good chance that they might overestimate what they know about the word, right? So they might tell you, yeah, 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 I know that word. And then upon, upon further in, you know, questioning, they don't know that word, but that's where the questioning piece comes in. And then you say, oh, okay. So you thought tragedy meant this, but it, you know, it actually means this. So maybe you need to move that down to you've seen it and heard it, but you're not quite sure what it means. Helping them understand what, where their level of knowledge is and how they can kind of self-evaluate. But we would assume with deaf or hearing kids that they're gonna overestimate this piece. They're gonna think they know more than they do. It's very common. Closed passages, these are gonna look real familiar when I show them to you. You can um, choose an important part of text or you can find some that are already made or already made. And you take out the words, you, most of the time you're gonna take out the vocabulary words, right? And then they're gonna put the vocabulary words back in. You can use it before they read to help them kind of build knowledge, or you can use it after they read to reinforce that knowledge. And I'll just show you an example. So if you're talking about profits, so you have your word list here the graph that they're reading, and then they're going in and putting in based on what these words mean. If you'd like to create your own, here are the directions. It's, if you want, if you're looking at spe specifically at vocabulary, you're gonna wanna obviously pull out the vocabulary words, but there are, there are def, um, directions such as how long it should be where the word, if you pull it out, it might be more confusing. Um, and then also, you know, how many, how many lines it should, how many lines the closed thing should be if you want to, um, if you want to create your own. And you can read that for yourself later. You also can do categorization activities. We actually saw one of these earlier with um, the word journal page. So giving them four to six words per grouping and asking them to circle the words. Actually, I think I skipped over. This is not the one that's like what we saw earlier. This is a different thing. Um, giving them four to six words and then asking them to circle the word that shouldn't be there or asking them to cross out the word that doesn't belong and have them tell you why. So I'll just give you an example of that. This activity is called bump or bump it. Essentially, you look at the first set of words in the first blue box and the second set of words and what word from this blue box should go into the second one. So it doesn't fit with this first category, it should go into the second one. So in this particular situation, the first um, box is talking about different types of hearing aids, bone anchored, behind the ear, in the ear, in the canal. So conductive is actually a type of loss. So we would move that over to the next category. And then you do the same thing. Now we have this group of words. What word in this group of words should go to the next category? And this is really when we talked about, you know, not just doing worksheets and, and dictionary work. This is really thought provoking, critical thinking about the vocabulary words to figure out which one should go to the next group. So you have to not only think about the group it's in, you have to think about the group it's headed to. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about learning the depth of a word or um, you know, something that can become part of their internal lexicon or vocabulary because they have to know the word in depth to be able to do that. This is just one activity. There's tons of activities like this. This is just an example. I think our last example is gonna be these concept circles. So the first one is it has the four concepts and they're trying to tell you what those four concepts are related to. The second one, you actually, they need to get rid of the thing that does not belong. So rivers, oceans, lakes, clearly they need to get rid of mountains. And the third one is they need to add the example. So alliance, treaty, pack, and then they need to give you another word. So these will help. Remember we talked about that organization, learning things in groups. That's how all of this can be. Um, you can reinforce those ideas. What should we really not be doing? We definitely should not be doing dictionary work. Um, this is your traditional, here's the word, 
copy the dictionary definition. Here's the word, copy the dictionary definition. It's not terribly helpful because oftentimes they don't understand that dictionary definition or just like any other kid, they're just gonna copy it because that's what you told them to do. Now having to put it in their own words is something that might enrich that activity, but it's not really helpful overall. Worksheets or workbooks without any explicit instructions, not very helpful. So if they're just working, if it's just kind of an out of class activity that's disconnected from what they're learning in class, it's not gonna be that helpful. If you are integrating it into class, you know, matching a, a vocabulary list with a passage, the passage you're teaching in depth in class, the words are part of that, then that can be helpful. But if it's kind of a standalone thing, it's not really going to have the effect that you're hoping for. I mean, maybe they'll learn a word or two here or there, but if you think about the amount of time they might be putting into the workbook as to much they're learning or how much they're learning, it may not be equivalent or even close to the same. Word searches and crossword puzzles are really not that beneficial in learning new words. Um, they can be fun, they can be entertaining, but those types of activities are really based in when you, are, when you already have a full command of a language, right? You already have a full command of English, you already have a full command of Spanish or whatever it is, those are word puzzles. So you already have to have a pretty robust language base to do a word puzzle. It's just like any other concept where we talk about, you know, you have to have a pretty robust basis in ASL to be able to do word play or sign play in ASL, right? You have to really understand how the language works. Same for English. You have to really understand how the language works in order to do word play in that language. And that is part of normal, you know, development. But word searches and crossword puzzles are kind of like word play in that same concept. So they're not terribly beneficial. This is the called the smart sign dictionary. This is not going to have every word that you have in your classes, but it's just a, it's a resource. I think it has, last I heard it has around 5,000 words. This is an easy one, but so you put in the word, it gives you a picture. So if it was a word that has multiple meanings, like, uh, let's try, make. okay, here we go. So if you put in the word make, and it has a couple different meanings, you click the meaning that you're looking for. So you'd have to teach the students, okay, well, you want to click the meaning that you're looking for. So, oh, I was thinking about this make, the make of a car. Click on that one, then it gives me the sign. It's not perfect. I'm not gonna have every word in the universe. <laughs> um, and also it created in the Southeast. So some of the signs might be different than ours. So just know that piece. But it is a tool and the um, link will be in your in the presentation when it's sent out and definitely something that you can explore it might have some of the words that you need in it or you can what we've done is just given it to students and say hey you know if you're reading you can't find a word type in here see if it's there maybe it'll be there um and i think that is about it so my ad i emailed you my needs at your might already have it or I'm in the system. So I will take questions if there are any. So I have a question it says, can you review briefly the chart of knowledge depth necessary to understand a text? The chart. In order to understand a text in your content area, so when you're reading not a story, so in their textbook in a reading that you provide a student, they're gonna need to know they're going to have to be all the way over at this level. If I can make it go. They're going to have to be able to, they know the word and they can explain it. So you would have to, let's say you gave this. This is also a knowledge rating that we looked at last in that last couple of slides. Let's say you gave this to a student and they said, yep, I know this word and I can explain it. Say, okay, explain it. And then maybe they can't, or maybe they can, but they have to know it to that level. They have to be able to almost be able to for all goods and purposes, teach it, teach what that word means in order to really understand whatever content you're, you or they're trying to read in the class. So they can't just have this kind of surface understanding of the word. Um, if it was a story, sometimes in you know novels, something that might be more uh, nonfiction, a surface understanding might be okay because they can kind of get the overall gist of what's going on. 
but it's not going to be okay when you're talking about content area reading because a gist is not going to give you the understanding that you need to use that text to learn from. Hopefully that understands the question or answers the question. I personally would probably use this one over the other one that we looked at because you always want to give them where they can't go middle of the road, right? So if you give them four, they have to either decide whether they've just seen it or heard it or whether they think they know it and that kind of differentiates. So they have to decide and they can't just always go for that middle of, I've seen it, I've heard it, I don't know. So it gives a little bit more discrimination. That's a good question. Thank you, interpreters. Thank you, captionists, much appreciated. Everybody have a good afternoon and I'll see you again on November 15th.